Michael Spado was born on December the 17th, 1944 in Rome, New York, where he attended high school at Rome Free Academy. At the age of 18, Ori joined the U.S. Army and served as his country proudly and was discharged honorably in 1966. He returned to Rome and had various jobs until he sold insurance for the Prudential Insurance Company, where he was a leading agent. After his first marriage and three children, Ori moved to San Francisco, where he was married to his second wife, and then after another divorce, he moved to Beverly Hills, California, where he became known as the Hollywood Fixer, doing favors for alias celebrities and others. People referred to him as the Hollywood Mob Boss. In 2008, he was arrested at his home in Beverly Hills and brought to Brooklyn on a Colombo crime family RICO indictment. He has enjoyed a friendship with legendary underboss Sonny Frances of the Colombo family for over 40 years and remains friends until this day. So thank you so much, Ori. And you were telling me earlier that Mr. Frances had passed away. You know, uh, I have a difficult time even with my hearing aids on, on steam yard at hearing you. So you're going to have to speak a little louder. Bridget. I okay. apologize. I only had this problem on Steam Yard. Okay, well, I'll talk louder, okay? Can you hear me now? I hear you, yes. I have okay. to strain. Go ahead. Come on, let's do this. Okay. So, uh, Mrs. Spado, can you tell us about your childhood? I had a great childhood, to be honest. All right. I had a childhood that everybody be envious today. But, you know, I grew up at a different time. I grew up at 215 West Liberty Street, Rome, New York. We had no telephones. Didn't have a car. Okay. We communicated. We played on the streets with our, our friends. We were home every night for dinner. I had two brothers, three sisters. Uh, I had a great childhood, honestly, when I think back. My mom and dad were always there, and it was mandatory. Be home for dinner every night, and we were. It was a great time. So I had a great childhood. The, the young kids today, unfortunately, will never know. Because of technology. Mm -hmm. Technology is destroying our country. It's destroying our youth because parents are giving children a cell phone the moment they're able to talk and they become embedded in that telephone and when they're confronted to have a real conversation with a real life person, they're not able to. You're this correct. Yeah, you're correct. And you know, um, Mr. Spado, Ori, um, I, first of all, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And we're yeah. about to celebrate Memorial Day. And, um, you know, we want to just think about all the um, military that have, you know, labored hard for us. And we want to remember the ones that has passed away. But we thank you for your service. Thank you. I appreciate that, Bridget. So when um, you grew up in Rome, New York, and you had a great childhood, and then you went to the Army and you served us honorably. Thank you so much. Yes. And you know, so all when... that there is in my book, Bridget. Mm -hmm. And I urge people, if they want a book, it's a great read. Don't take my word. Go read the reviews. Look at my social media. See what people are saying about my book. It's there. And, you know, uh, you know, it I lived after I begot, became an uh, uh, affiliated with La Cosa Nostra. 
I lived the greater part of my life in the shadows. Okay. Now, we have a saying, what happens in the shadows stays in the shadows. People don't understand what that means. Mm -hmm. On the East Coast, I was with the underboss of the Colombo crime family, who was a dear friend of mine, Sonny Franchise, right up until his death at the age of 103, two years ago. On the West Coast, I was with the underboss of Los Angeles, Jimmy Cachi. And he, Jimmy was also the boss of Palm Springs, California. Okay. Jimmy and I were extremely close. We were like brothers. Mm -hmm. So from the East Coast to West Coast, I'm a very unusual guy in the North Coast of North Africa. I really got friends that are two bosses, two different families. Okay, okay. You don't see that there. It's unusual. In addition, if you read my book, you see I knew Frank Gassel, Maya Lansky, Russell Boffolino, a whole slew of others. And I was able to call these people on a direct basis at that time. So, and so you were their friend. Huh? You were not, you were their friend. You were not. Uh, you know, you were not their yes, enemy. Yes, I was. I, I, I consider myself a friend. Okay, and therefore, you know, I, Sonny Franchise wanted to propose me back in New York, and I said no. I didn't want to be. I didn't want to be proposed. I did not want to become, as they say, get my button. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a lot of guys. That's their dream growing up to become a made man of the coast of North. Out here in California, right in my living room, Stevie Sino came in from Las Vegas with some other people from Las Vegas. Jimmy Koch, he was going to get me made. And I I can remember laying on my couch because, you know, Jimmy, my home was like Jimmy's home. Mm -hmm. And all these guys are around. I said, no, I don't want that. You know? Mm -hmm. I want to stay where I am. And it is... Uh, once, you know, I, I lived in the shadows and out here in Hollywood, when I would walk into a room, a restaurant, people, people touching me here. Oh, uh, yeah, they loved you, Ori. The Everyone perception, loves you. the perception of who I was was there but not the reality. And the reality of who I was actually happened when I got arrested and got indicted on a Colombo crime family indictment. And I was chained in shackle, brought back to Brooklyn to fight my case where I ended up serving five years. Okay, okay. And one thing that I say to a lot of people, and I like you all to know this, I take full responsibility for everything in my life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there were some ugly. My life was my destiny. Mm -hmm. I own it. I had no regrets. People ask me, regrets? No, regret is a negativity. Mm -hmm. So I don't dwell on things. And quite honestly, I think it was fortunate that I did get indicted that I did go to the prison. Otherwise, if that did not happen, I would have continued doing what I was doing mm -hmm. and probably ended up with more serious charges and ended up dying in prison. And so since my release from prison and since my book, The Accidental Gangster, which is a time bestseller, Being made into a film, I can't tell you when, but it's being made. It's going to be directed by George Gallo. Mm -hmm. It's in the works. There's a documentary in the works. Now I've seen me. that you. I've seen that you posted. He's actually going to be on Clubhouse on Friday. Huh? He's going to be on Clubhouse on Friday. Yes, George Gallo yeah. will be my guest this Friday on Clubhouse. Oh, good. And George Gallo was probably one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my entire life in Hollywood. 
Okay. Well, Ori, look like one of your friends found you. So Jason Klingner, he says, good morning. So well, Jason. Good morning, Jason. I see Jason's over here. Yeah, All Jason, right. if you can share um, this page to Ori's page, I would appreciate it. That way others can see the the live also. I really appreciate that, Jason. So, Mr. Ori, so once you um, you got out of um, you got out of the army, and then you went into insurance sales. Yes, I went in the insurance with the Prudential Insurance Company. I became a leading agent, a member of the Million Dollar Roundtable. I was making a lot of money. And then from there, I ended up having my own agency, the Ori Agency, where I got involved in credit, life, accident, health insurance, on the financing of loans with automobile dealers. Mm -hmm. And I became one of the pioneers in the automobile after sale business. Okay. So you can blame me So for when you go into a car dealership to buy a car, and they say, well, you know, once you find a car you like, they bring it to the finance and insurance manager, business manager. They got all sorts of names. And then he's going to convince you to finance the car with the dealership. Mm -hmm. And then he's going to put credit life in action and health on loan. Then he's going to sell you a paint seal, an undercoating, an alarm, a warranty. And oh, so you you're responsible you for all it. of that. Okay. <laughs> And everything, it's only going to cost you $2 a month more for this. Only $5 a month more for this. Okay? And it's a big, big profit center. I taught dealers back in those days how to sell a car at cost and still make $2,000. Wow. And that's in the 60s and 70s. Okay? So just imagine what it is today. So and, where did you get that? Where did you get that um, ambition and knowledge from? Was it from growing up? Did your parents? No. Well, look, I've been hustling since I was 10, 11 years old. I had a paper route. Today, there's no paper routes for these kids. Mm -hmm. Okay. I learned to knock on doors or trying to get new subscribers to, for people to subscribe to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. I learned how to be you know, people saying no to me. I got rejected, but it was the sales that I got to count it. So I was winning sales contests. Mm -hmm. One sales contest I won was I won a trip to Syracuse, New York to go see the movie, The Bible. I think it was Bible or Ben-Hur, one of them. Okay, but I'll never forget that. And now when I got through delivering the newspapers, I would cut lawns in the summertime, shovel walks in the winter. I hustled. So I've oh, so hustling. you always were a, a very yeah, so, entrepreneur's yeah, person. So when I created the insurance business, I, uh, the finance and insurance business with the automobile dealers, the after sale market, I saw the need there. Mm -hmm. It all came from my mind, from talking to mm -hmm. dealers, and I knew that the Salesmen had to be trained, and then I started training what's called finance insurance manager. I actually purchased an old school in Rome, New York, mm -hmm. all right, where I had my offices on one side and my training school on the other. Wow. So we brought people in, and church companies were sending me people for training. Okay. Yeah. So you did that for how many years? Huh? How many years did you do in sell insurance? Until I got indicted. <laughs> wow. So you went that, that long. My first indictment. No, my first indictment was in Syracuse Federal Court. Okay. If one person was not a rat, this kid that I took from Syracuse, New York, he was successful in insurance business. He was making 30 something thousand a year. I took him and I trained him and I gave him Syracuse, New York, Onondaga County. He was making 100000 a year with me, plus I gave him a brand new nick in every year. But he found out the deal that I had with the insurance company 
and try to take the insurance agency over. When in fact, I had Dino De Laurentiis, famous film producer, director out here in Hollywood, was raising $12 million. Where I was going to bring my Ori agency on a national basis. Okay. All right. If he would have kept his mouth shut, he'd be a multi, multi, multi millionaire today. But people think they're smart until they're proven stupid. And that's what happened. But you know what? That was the past. Tomorrow's another day. Mm -hmm. Now, so at first you were just doing it, just doing your job. And what what made you, what enticed you to, you know, kind of reach out and do other things? Say was again. it the money? Uh, what enticed you to move out and do other things outside of insurance? Well, after I lost my insurance license, being a hustler, I always had to figure a way to make money. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, uh, through the years, my friend Frank Russo was introducing me to a lot of people. Uh, I, I had read, I knew a, a lot about La Costa Nostra through the years. I learned the rules, the laws. The politics and I learned about the life and I became part of that there okay okay so if you had to that, you know I was not a child like most of these kids in Brooklyn who were in the neighborhood wanted to grow up or wanted to be in my I was not that my grandfather came over from Italy he was a main member okay of La Costa Nostra Okay. We came from Calabria. Uh, and, you know, my, they didn't want it for anybody else in the family, but I ended up, okay, it was in my blood. And I liked it, I gotta be honest, there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. We enjoyed things. You know, I, um, I was thinking, um, about Where are what you, you were saying. I lost you. I'm still yeah. here. I don't know what happened. I was thinking about what you were saying, how um, you were very ambitious. You you grew, you learned a lot, you taught a lot of people how to grow, but then you had a turn in your life. And a lot of people have these crossroads that they get to and they make decisions that are not good for them. So how would you speak to a young person today at that crossroad? What would you tell them? Well, I have mentored many young children and kept them out of a life. I think we're frozen or. A crime. Okay. 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 Life at a different I know before cell phones came around, you know, I was in it at a different time. It was much better then. It's all changed. Uh, you know, I quit smoking once I'm back to it. Uh, I, I give a lot of advice to kids to stay out of life of crime. I mentor them. You know, I was fortunate that as I grew up, for some reason, all my friends were always older than me. Mm -hmm. And I learned from them, even in La Cosa Nostra. Sonny okay. Frances obviously was older than me. Jimmy Cacci was older than me. Frank Russo was older than me. All these people were older than me, but I learned from them. And... It was a great education that I had. I learned from some of the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, you know, I'm, I'm just a guy that's got to continuously do, I can't relax. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly on the move, even at my age of 77. I don't let my age bother me. 
And actually, because I'm 77, had a conversation with my son. I said, there's a lot I got to do. Mm -hmm. He said, Pops, you should relax. I said, no, you don't understand. I'm racing against time now. I'm not a youngster. So I don't know if I had three days, three months, or 30 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that I want to do. I want to give my wisdom of things that I learned to be able to help other people succeed, have better lives, mm -hmm. be successful and be happy, and try to make this world a better place. If I could do my part and get more people to start doing that there mm -hmm. and make other people happy, we can make this world a better place. But it's going to take all of us. I can't do it single-handedly. And, but you know, I'm so happy that you're saying that because with us going through what we went through this week with the shooting at the elementary school, you know, um, there are so many young people who are so misguided. And so I know what you're doing to help young people understand themselves. Can you speak to us about mindset? Say again, I'm sorry. Can you speak to us about mindset, about having a positive mindset? Everything we do comes from here. Our mindset. Our mind is the most powerful thing that we have. I can remember years ago reading our brain. Our brain, we can store more information than any computer they ever built. Okay? I don't know if that's still true. That was true at one time. Okay? And I'm fortunate that I have a very great memory. I can remember what kids were wearing when I had a fight when I was 12 years old. Okay. Wow. Okay. I don't forget things. Uh, so, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing when I could be laying on a beach in Florida? Uh, I'm doing it because this is a particular time in our country that we need it more. Mm -hmm. All right. We have the real core, the real crooks in this world. And where's the real organized crime? Where do you think it is? Where's the real organized crime, Bridget? I want to say our government. <laughs> You're correct. Washington, D.C. You know something? In the back of my book here, I wrote letters to a lot of my friends who are deceased, to my family members. But the last letter is to the U.S. House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. Folks, if you don't buy my book for any other reason, buy it to read that letter to the U.S. House of Representatives. You see, people do not understand our government, how it works. Mm -hmm. People want more, more. Every race wants more and more. Mm -hmm. but they don't understand the basics of our government. When they vote, they don't know what they're voting for. Mm -hmm. They either vote red or blue. They never read the ballots. They don't know what laws they're voting into. They don't know nothing about these people. Why do we got people that are 85 years old in the U.S. House of Representatives? Now, 85 is going a little too far. There should be age limits. Why are we getting more youth to get in the office to make more changes, changes that are better, not law? Yeah. We don't need laws for everything. Guns don't kill. It's the people who hold the guns that kill. You're right. All right. They want to talk mental illness. So a few people have mental illness. Not everybody has mental illness. No. But when people watch the news and they see these, and it, we're not getting real news. You're getting disinformation. 
And I'm going to be talking about that in another room, a clubhouse, all week with my friend Scott Bernstein, who okay. is a mafia historian, particularly on Jimmy Hoffa. You've probably seen Scott. He's on every show whenever they're discussing Jimmy Hoffa. And he will be at the dig in New Jersey when they go digging in hopes of finding Jimmy Hoffa's body buried in New Jersey. History Channel will be filming it. Scott Bernstein will be there. They will not find Jimmy Hoffa's body there. It's not there. Okay, well, do you know that where it is? <laughs> that this disinformation was planted 45 years ago by the very people who got rid of Jimmy Hoffa. Oh, boy. And it's still going. Okay? And this is why, you know, I was in the clubhouse room last night, and this gentleman, Jeff, really good guy, big influencer, he said, people, kids are not reading today. Kids don't read. You know, people, kids write me and ask me where they can get my book. When I was a kid, I was reading. I still have a book here. Look at this book that I have since 1960. Lucky Luciano. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I was reading in the uh, yeah in in the army. I learned how to read and keep up with what's going on with mm -hmm. the news of the world. Reading as a child, when the teacher would put me in a cloakroom because I I used to like to pull the girls' hair and pull their bras and stuff like that. There, <laughs> I always got caught and they put me in a cloakroom. But the folk room was right next to the library, so I sneak in and get a book. I used to like to be there by, by myself, reading a book. Takes me right out of the zone. While yeah. I'm in prison, I read over 300 books. And today, I read each and every night I have a book. Got a new author. All right, I, I like CIA thrillers, things like that there. Mm -hmm. uh, but kids don't read today. I really agree with you. And I know that if we had stricter, like you said, not laws, but we need some changes. We need some changes in our country because we need to keep our children safe and we're not doing a good job at it at now, all. Look at these, this thing, uh, Buffalo, New York, Texas, and tomorrow to be someplace else. Yeah. Okay. So Ori, so you um so you went to prison in two thousand eight, and it was on a RICO charge. Yeah, rec racketeering influenced corrupt organization. That okay. bill was signed by Richard Nixon in nineteen seventy one. Richard Nixon signed that bill not to get rid of organized crime. He got it. He signed it in the hopes of getting and stopping drugs from coming into this country. Okay. Well, we know how that works. Okay. And what do you hear about? You hear about the drugs on the news all the time. They're not going to stop it. You're not going to stop anything because the need is there. Mm -hmm. And as long as the need is there, the supply will always be there. Mm-hmm. you got to get these people help. But no, they're on the streets. They're all over. They've got their bikes. They're doing their drugs. They're addicted. I had a girlfriend. She's dead. Overdosing. So, you know, I know what it is. Do people who actually have to go through and live a life like I did to, eat, to learn? No, they don't have to. But they would read. 
if parents would spend more time with their children, make sure their children are home for dinner every night at the dinner table. And the parents spend time talking to their children about what they're doing in school, what they're learning in school, what books they reading. No. If they do have them, they're probably talking about their, their you know, the husband and wife are talking about what they did at work that day. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with the children. You're right. So we have a lot of fixing up to do. And now know, with the um with the the RICO charge, how um our young people, I've seen several rappers lately have been indicted on RICO charges. Do yes, the young say, people understand okay. what they're getting into? No, the young kids do not understand what the RICO is. Okay, and let's go back and you're gonna see an interview coming out uh with Larry Mazza. Uh, be on Plex TV. It's called Mob Talks. Okay. In 1931, this man right here, Lucky Luciano, formed the commission. It took place in Atlantic City, New Jersey. Everybody from around the country was there. Al Capone from Chicago, guys from Boston, people from all around, gangsters from all over. The commission was formed. We are a brotherhood around the world. People fail to realize that there. Okay, it's one brotherhood. So once you're made, the guy in Boston, the guy in Chicago, the guy in Italy is your brother. Okay. Okay. And where was it going? We were Nick, talking about young Nick, people and the RICO charge. Nick, Nixon signed the bill. But it laid stagnant for many years until Rudy Giuliani came along. And Joe Bonanno, who was the crime, who founded the Bonanno crime family and was sent to Arizona for a lot of reasons, he wrote a book. And in that book, he outlined everything of how La Costa Nostra worked right up until the time that he left it. When Rudy Giuliani read that, he had the blueprint that he needed. All he had to do was fill in the gaps after that there. And that's when he started using the RICO Act to bring in things. So if you and I, you can come to me and what happened to me right here on my couch where an informant was here from New York wearing a wire and the wife of a friend of mine came to me to, because her husband was in prison and some guys in Brooklyn owed a half a million on cocaine charge, on cocaine that they were given by him. And the Mexicans were here and asked me to get help get their money. And then the informants talk, talking to the Mexicans say, hey, if you get me 50 kilos, we can move 50 kilos every two weeks. I got the truck that transported this and that. Well, they weren't going to give it to us without paying. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he says, everything's got to go through Ori. Okay. I said, I've never been in a cocaine business. I've never done that. Okay. Now, when he leaves, when the foreman leaves here and goes back to New York, he talks to the captain, the acting captain of the Colombo family. All right. And he's telling the captain of all the money we're going to make with Ori on this cocaine thing. There's no cocaine. It's not oh, no. Cocaine. I'm not doing it. Okay. But he's talking to him. He's got him up expecting all this money to come. And guess what happens? The indictment comes down. I'm indicted on a cocaine charge of 50 kilos or more facing life in prison. Oh, no. And guess who else is indicted? Who? Michael Carapano in New York. He and I never had a word. Never had a word about it. But he got indicted because the informant was talking to him. You see how it comes together? 
So that's how you became the accidental gangster? No, no, that's not how I became oh, no. the accidental gangster. <laughs> okay, that's how I got indicted. Okay, this is how they can use the RICO Act. Okay, okay. just by somebody talking. It becomes a conspiracy. Oh, now, okay. You gotta remember something. 1931, when Lucky Luciano formed the commission, if you got caught, you went to prison. If you got a 15-year bid, you might do three years. 20-year bid, you might do five years. Come on, we could do that standing on our head. That's no big deal. Okay? But then in 1991, our now President Joseph Biden wrote the worst crime bill in history. Yes, Joe Biden, our president, he wrote the worst crime bill. Including that was minimum mandatory sentencing. Including that was billions of dollars to give to the states if they agreed to increase their statutory, uh, make it mandatory sentencing guidelines that you had to do 85% of your time. Now, if you were a state in Michigan and you agreed to that there to do that, you got a lot of money from the federal government. So, of course, most of them did it. So now when somebody goes to prison, they got to do 85% of their time. Okay. Now, what happened when Joe Biden, this is education, I'm going back to education. What happened when Joe Biden signed that bill? If you look at the chart, when Joe Biden did that bill, they got a red arrow that shoots up in the air like a rocket. That's the blacks that got incarcerated as a result. Went straight up. Okay. Marijuana, all sorts of minor stuff. Okay. And the prisons are full and then all the money he, they gave for private prisons. Private prisons is a great stock for people to buy because the prisons are full. We are 5% of the world. The United States is 5% of the world's population, but we house 25% of inmates in prison. Why? that bill. Now, who's our president? Where's the memory of people? People forget. All right. The very same people that put this guy in the office are the same people that this guy put into prison. Does that make sense to you? No. Right. So, Ori, what can we do as as people, as the community, what can we do to keep our young people out of this system? Well, it's got to begin with education, number one. But it begins at home. A lot of young kids that I mentor, I end up talking to their parents. Because, you know, when a kid grows, you know, why do they become, you know, La Costa Nostra? That's our family. We're family. We're, you know, you take the oath. Once you take that oath, that's your family, not your wife and children. This family comes first. Let's take a young boy, wants to join the gang. He's not having good times at home. His parents aren't home. And they're not, mother's not cooking dinner. And he, older, it's an older guy. Takes him in, starts grooming him. Hey, man, you're my brother. You're my family. Okay? And they bring him in. That becomes his family. So can you blame a young man for wanting to go to that? Can you blame him? No, you really can't. Because he doesn't have anything at home. But he's got something going with these guys over here, with these other kids who are a little bit older than him. They might be out doing robberies, doing drugs. Selling drugs, they're making money. 
He's not doing that with his parents because his parents never taught him. So it begins at home. You agree with that? I agree with that. I agree with that. And so, so what are we going to do? Parents today, all they're thinking about is making money. But they should. They got to think of money. They got to put food on the table. It's understandable. But in our country today, everybody's expecting the government to give them everything. Put food on my table. Pretty sure they're going to want the government to come in and cook your meals. Okay? What, what's happening with all this? I live in the state of California. You have any idea what's going on here? No. Now walk the streets of Beverly Hills. You'll be surprised at the homeless people you see here in Beverly Hills. We never had that before. And now what's going to happen? The government gave us a few bucks, gave everybody a few bucks during this COVID. They gave you peanuts. People are not working again. You didn't have to pay your rent. You didn't have to pay your mortgages. But now here in California, next month, all that money comes due. Now what's going to happen with all these people who have not paid their rent in two years? Do you think they're going to be able to say, hey, Mr. Landlord, here's the money. I didn't pay in two years. No. They're not going to have the money. Okay, so what's going to happen? They're going to be on the street. And what's yeah. going to happen? They're going to end up on the streets. Our homeless population, instead of getting decreasing, it's going to increase. You're right. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. Uh, and me, I'm so happy. I can't happy. do it all, honey. I need everybody's help. That's right. And I'm asking everybody, read the ballast. Make, make an educated decision when you vote for somebody. Look at the turn on. You're getting disinformation, whether it's Fox, CNN, MSNBC. They're battling each other. They don't care about you. They care about how many more ratings they can get for the day and what shows are going to get the most ratings. They don't give a shit about us. And they're feeding you disinformation. They're not giving you news. In the old days, you got real news. Not happening today. This is such a great conversation, such a needed conversation. Well, and we really know, appreciate it. We only you. hope that millions of people could see this, pay a touch in, but they won't. They'll go on to the next thing. But if we only a few pay attention. Mm -hmm. Only a few do something, then we've done some good today, Bridget. You're right. You're right. And you have lived such a long life, and you've done so many things. Don't say Our long, young people, because I'm not through yet. <laughs> Our young people can learn so much from you, Ori. And so your book, you said that when you were in prison, you thought about writing a book. So did every you begin writing the book, book there? Every word in this book is the truth, folks. Now you're going to see pretty soon, next week or so, you will see less of me on social media, the clubhouse and other places. Because I'm going to be writing my next book. And it'll take me two or three months, but I'll be writing my next book. I don't know if we tell you the title, somebody might steal it from me. <laughs> well, but when you write that next book, please sure come back. Be another book out. Well, please come back and um, talk to us about it when you're finished. Um, this has been such a wonderful, wonderful interview. And I it really was appreciate awesome, Bridget, it. And I'm very happy that you had me. And, you know, get it out there on YouTube and get this out because we need to help the youth of our country. Oh, yes, we do. And on so that I'm going to say we're goodbye. We're going to share it. Okay, well, we're going right. to share it. And thank you so much, Mr. Ori Spado, you, the accidental that. gangster. And God please bless go you. to his God bless, God bless you too. And please bye go bye. to his website, www.theaccidentalgangster.com.
www.thepeopleshouse.com. Thank you so much.